I'm going to talk about the democracy climate nexus, and I'm doing so because um, taking a look at established democracies separately, some appear to be much more successful in dealing with climate change than others. A reason for this uh, might be that um, they deal in different ways with the unintended consequences of climate change inherently produced, such, for example, the periodicity of elections leading to short-termism, um, cyclic issue attention, threatening enlightening understanding, and dilatory as well as incremental procedures weakening their problem-solving capacities. Yet characteristics of climate change and the unintended consequences of democracy might contradict each other to different degrees. For example, some democracies perhaps find better solutions than others to overcome their short-termism and able to be better to deal with climate change and the long time horizon of it than others. So besides a lot of other factors that um, affect the climate performance of democracies, um, the level of democracy might be one explanatory factor. And I think it's very important that political, social, cultural scientists start to think about uh, climate change and start to investigate it in much more intense ways than uh, so far. And uh, this remembered me of an article I read some time ago, which is called God Gave Physics the Easy Problems, Adapting Social Science to an Unpredictable World. Since climate physics is quite clear, um, we know that the emissions are raising, we know the effects, um, maybe climate physics can um, redefine a little bit their models, they may um, enhance some of these uh, parts, but actually we, we know what's happening. And so um, my claim is that climate change means also social, political and cultural change. And this is why it's important to look from it also from this angle. Um, I'm gonna present first my argument um, on the issue and then show you some results on a more quantitative way where I run some panel regressions and you see um, in which way democratic quality influences climate performance. And this is part of the book um, I've published called Democracy and Climate Change. So about the argument. Um, you can find in the literature two sides. Um, there are some arguing that there are a lot of shortcomings, and these are because of the characteristics of democracy. I already mentioned some of them, um, for example, the periodicity of elections leading to this short-termism, but there are also uh, the characteristics of climate change. It's a very wicked problem. It's highly complex. Um, it has very long-term effects. It needs crucial changes of our lifestyles. And there are, of course, these more general arguments that Democracies are not capable to deal with climate change because they already have an overloaded uh, government, that politicians are not very well trained in scientific issues. But if you look at the other side of uh, research, you find also um, some advantages. So there are characteristics of democracy that might be promising. For example, if you look at the World Value Surveys, um, then the median voter favors climate action more and more over the years. Um, and there are a lot of improvements in face of climate change, especially at the regional and at the local level. So there are a lot of deliberative procedures. There are mini publics um, and other forms. And of course, um, we can argue in a more general way that democracy enables cooperation. Um, if you look, for example, how often democracies go to war with each other, then they do this less uh, more often than um, autocracies do. And of course, Democracies are capable of political learning. When you look at the empirical results, um, you can see that, um, and I have one quote here, autocracies are not that good in dealing with climate change than democracies. And I will read here one uh, paper, um, one result of one paper from Betty and Bernau, and they say the results show that the effect of democracy on levels of political commitment to climate change mitigation policy output is positive. Policy output means in this regard that democracies are more likely to sign treaties, to develop policies, to set th themselves targets than autocracies. In contrast, the effect on policy outcomes measured in terms of emission levels and trends is ambiguous. So even though democracies are doing much better in terms of um, developing treaties, uh, developing policies to fight against climate change, they do not so good in terms of actually reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. But overall, it's a very mixed picture. 
Um, the results depend on the countries investigated, the democracy and client performance measures applied, and the time um, periods explored. But overall, I would say there's some weak positive tendency. So I started thinking about, well, if we know more or less that there's this, this, this positive tendency that democracies are probably more capable than uh, autocracies to do with climate change, what about democracies themselves? I mean, there are around one third of the countries in the world where you can say they are more or less democratic and they probably uh, do very, very differently on their climate uh, performance and policies. So how does the quality of democracy of these countries actually influence uh, their climate performance? And my assumption is that more democratic quality is more capable of creating those competencies required to influence climate performance positively. Um, and I would call that some sort of democratic efficacy. And one main reason for this expectation can be seen in society's requirements for certain democratic dimensions, such as creativity to find solutions and pathways for major transformations as they are required in the context of climate change. Furthermore, more established democracies with more democratic quality are assumed to better prepare to critically investigate whether they are pursuing the right policies and are in a position to respond to unforeseen challenges. And current democracies um, also face the challenge that they are too often rely on private opinions or the aggregation of private opinion through polls, while the democratic ideal assumes that decision-making should rely on public judgment instead. This democratic efficacy, assuming that democracy's ability to produce the desired and intended client performance improves with increasing levels of democratic quality, could, for political practice, be translated in the simple term, um, and that's here in the middle, fixing climate change means fixing democracy. And this argument that uh, fixing climate change means fixing democracy can be found in quite a couple of um, uh, papers and books that deal with the transformation of societies to sustainability. You find this, for example, in this book, Transitions to Sustainable Development, where um, they argue that there are a lot of change agents in democracies in um, certain areas of the society where they do experimenting with lifestyles that are not that greenhouse gas intense as um, they are actually now, and that these new practices might influence the current dominant regimes and that these actually change and that this might also change the way we deal with climate change. You find other reports, for example, from the German Reserve Council on Global Change, um, where they write that, and I was part of that, a social contract um, for sustainability is needed. And this means that you have a more proactive state, but at the same time that this state sets new and more active and more ambitious targets, you increase participation and you don't lose uh, the democratic quality. And you find similar arguments, for example, uh, in the Earth System Governance literature. So looking at the empirical uh, data, um, it's important for us to um, explore I mean, what's meant by democracy? Uh, most of you would probably say, well, democracy uh, we have in Finland is a democracy, but in, um, uh, in Germany is also a democracy, in Italy that's a democracy, and wherever you go around the world, there are many countries declaring themselves democracy, but what does actually democracy mean? Um, I define democracy, or I would say that democracy has meant things to different people at different times and places and this is why the history of the idea of democracy is curious and um, the history of democracy is also puzzling. And in simple terms, throughout human history people have developed many democratic theories and founded a wide range of states they describe democratic. Consequently, the term democracy has at the same time an empirical reference and a normative ideal connotation. Hence, democracy is not a closed concept. Uh, it is possible for new dimensions of democratic quality to rise, for existing ones to develop further or to de decline completely. Many dimensions of democratic quality have developed both theoretically and empirically through the practice of democratic states and societies, or in the interplay between both fairs. Interdependence between the theories of democracy and the development of democratic practice is of crucial importance. So a definition of democratic quality has to be very open-minded about the wide range of democratic dimensions which can develop in different ways and also be combined in different ways. And um, 
if you look at the democratic theory literature, their freedom, equality, and control seem to be the meta dimensions uh, or to be the boundary contested principles for this boundary contested concept of democracy most democratic theories would agree upon. They are the basic principles which democratic movements have fought for throughout the history of democracy and are, in different connotations and writings, the anchor points of theories of democracy, something which had to be, uh, has to be lent them both empirical power and a plenary character. There are sound reasons why there are these three principles. Freedom is a basic principle since it ensures that individual rights are guaranteed while also enabling creative forces to further develop democratic quality. However, for all citizens to have the same ability to make use of their rights, political equality must also ensure that these citizens all have equal, equal um, opportunities to influence political power. So freedom and equality are interrelated, I would say. In order to decide what equality means to them and how it should be realized, citizens need the right to speak freely about it as well as equal, have equal opportunities to do so. Control, as the third dimension, meanwhile ensures that the will of the demos is accountably implemented under the rule of law and that their understanding of equality is actually implemented. So these three dimensions serve each other and enable each other uh, rather than contradicting each other, I would say. And if you now go to um, the empirical data, you see that so far um, we were only able to separate between autocracies and democracies. And there are such indices like polity four, um, where you can see if you count, or if you put in this index all the 17 most democratic uh, countries, they all group together. There's no separation between such countries, as I mentioned earlier, between Finland, Italy, Germany, um, Iceland, uh, the US. And the same is true for another index that separates between autocracies and democracies, um, Freedom House, they all group together. So there's actually no difference. And just recently, the democracy barometer, a pretty new index, um, uh, separated democracies from each other. And how does it do that? It has a very much, uh, um, very much deeply outlined um, concept and it defines democratic quality based on uh, three principles. These are the principles I mentioned, uh, certain functions, components, subcomponents, and indicators. And I have just one example here, how they do that uh, for individual liberties. And the component there is uh, the right to physical integrity and the subcomponent in this regard, constitutional provisions guaranteeing physical integrity and the indicator is then that the existence of constitutional provisions uh, banning torture or inhuman treatment in case there are no constitutional provisions, the signing of binding international treaties was also considered. So they do this for, for a wide range of these indicators to separate whether a democracy becomes, is, is ranked in this um, index more democratic or less democratic. The other side is of course, how do you measure climate performance? And I use, the climate performance and climate change performance index from Chermwatch, um, an environmental NGO, and they separate um, climate performance in certain areas, emissions development, development of uh, emissions, and these both are what I previously called a political outcome, so the actual greenhouse gas emissions, um, climate policy, this would have been the policy output, so signing treaties, um, how do they develop uh, their uh, own climate policies, and then they also added something uh, in between these both areas, efficiency and renewable energies. And if you now run um, uh, some statistics and you can put um, the countries in also this figure, you see on the um, left side, the y-axis with the democratic, uh, with the climate performance index measure um, a mean between 2005 and 2012 and at the x-axis um, the mean of the democracy parameter that they spread a quite quite a lot and you see um, that the countries that are often ranked uh, very high in also other rankings like health or uh, social insurance and so on like Sweden and Denmark are also very good here in doing uh, climate performance and uh, democratic quality. There's a group of states right at the bottom, uh, United States, Luxembourg, Australia, Canada especially, that um, do very bad 
uh, from these democracies in terms of their climate performance. And you find Iceland uh, right in the middle. So what I did then was to run uh, some statistics on the question how does democratic quality influence client performance. And I also put in this model a lot of other variables. For example, the production of oil, gas, coal of a country, the income, um, the trade openness, and so on and so forth. So to separate really this um, influence of democratic quality. And what you see, and you have to read this uh, in the following way, if you increase democratic quality by one point, the climate change performance index increases by 2.2447. So if a country becomes more democratic over time, it also becomes more climate friendly, just better on climate performance. And the, this is the within component and the between component is um, if you look at countries at one point of time, but at a lot of countries. And the within component is um, you look at one country over a certain period of time. So it's just two different ways to measure that. Um, and also this uh, between component um, shows us that um, if you look between countries, um, that those who are uh, becoming over a certain period of time more democratic also become more climate friendly. And you also find um, such a significant result and that's the little star, uh, which uh, means these results are significant, we can trust them. Um, you find this also regarding the policy output, which means that demo more democratic democracies also are more likely to um, sign treaties, develop policies. We don't find this significance in the between component. And if you look at the actual greenhouse gas emissions, also, um, the results in the between component are positive, which means if um, democracies become more democratic, they are uh, less likely to um, do more greenhouse gas emissions to be, and so to reduce um, their emissions effect effectively. These results, um, as you see, are not in any case negative. And that's quite interesting. You don't have one negative result where the increase of democratic quality um, actually leads to better climate performance. So the result of this statistical analysis is democratize democracies uh, to deal with climate change. Thank you. <laughs>